A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. The people of Judah and the citizens of Jerusalem said, Come, let us contrive a plot against Jeremiah. It will not mean the loss of instruction from the priests, nor of counsel from the wise, nor of messages from the prophets. And so let us destroy him by his own tongue. Let us carefully note his every word. Heed me, O Lord, and listen to what my adversaries say. Must good be repaid with evil, that they should dig a pit to take my life. Remember that I stood before you to speak in their behalf, to turn away your wrath from them. Pebum Domini. Save me, O Lord, in your kindness. Save me, O Lord, in your kindness. You will free me from the snare they set for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commend my spirit. You will redeem me, O Lord, O faithful God. Save me, O Lord, in your kindness. I hear the whispers of the crowd that frighten me from every side, as they consult together against me, plotting to take my life. But my trust is in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. In your hands is my destiny. Rescue me from the clutches of my enemies and my persecutors. Sancti Evangelii secundum Matthäum. Gloria As Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside by themselves and said to them on the way, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and scourged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee approached Jesus with her sons and did him homage, wishing to ask him for something. He said to her, What do you wish? She answered him, Command that these two sons of mine sit, one at your right and the other at your left, in your kingdom. Jesus said in reply, You do not know what you are asking. Can you drink the chalice that I am going to drink? They said to him, We can. He replied, My chalice you will indeed drink. But to sit at my right and at my left, this is not mine to give, but is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard this, they became indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus summoned them and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and the great ones make their authority over them felt? But it shall not be so among you. Rather, Whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. 
Just so, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Verbum Domini. Dave Asherez is the general manager of our radio, and he recently told us that we're approaching now almost 300 affiliate AM and FM stations of the EWTN radio network. So these are local uh, radio stations that broadcast locally in AM and FM so that people can receive them in their automobiles and at home and so on. And so recently, I was home for one of those launches this past Wednesday, February 25th, was the launch of a new radio station in Dubuque, Iowa. I come from near that area. And so Tom Oglesby and others who have worked with him over the years had to overcome different obstacles to make this a reality. And thankfully, this past Wednesday, Actually, the evening before, they already went on the air. The first 24 hours was February 25th, this past Wednesday, and they had a very nice win uh, dinner and then talks of Thanksgiving and so on for this new launch. Because radio is something that can be a very effective way for us while we're engaged in the different activities of the day, maybe just driving in our automobiles or working at home, where we can learn more about the faith, where we can grow in our knowledge of the faith. And this is a low power station, so it just reaches Dubuque and maybe about 10 miles or so outside of Dubuque. But uh, we hope and know that this will be something that will be a blessing to the city of Dubuque. And for those of you, that's 98.3, for those of you who live in Dubuque, I encourage you to tune in, 98.3. Uh, the radio schedule is different than the television schedule, so there are other programs on our radio. And for those in other areas of the country, there's, as I said, there's almost 300 affiliates that you can go to our website to find a radio station that's near you, uh, that you could also benefit from that programming. Of course, it's always available also downstreaming on our website. Uh, while I was, I was also happy, you know, I've now been transferred and I serve up at the shrine in Hansville, so I don't have the televised mass as often, but I was grateful when I saw that I was scheduled for today, March 4th, because today is my mother's birthday, and so I wanted to wish her a happy birthday and to tell her, because I had a chance to visit my parents when I was home, that your birthday card is in the upper left drawer of the chest of drawers. <laughs> so I left it there, and you will find it there and happy birthday to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I've recently had a chance to reread a wonderful little book by Father Peter Stravinskis. And what he has done is he compiled seven different authors, he's one of them, to talk about priestly celibacy should priests be able to marry? That's a question that's been asked in recent decades. Many think that that would be the solution to the vocation crises and so on. But he addresses many different issues. He looks at it historically, scripturally, spiritually, the spiritual significance of the priest representing Jesus as the bridegroom and also psychologically. So there are different articles by seven different authors, including Protestant ministers and a Protestant minister's wife who wrote an article about this. And Father Stravinskis himself has in his uh, section here, he comments on the passage 1 Corinthians chapter 7. That is where St. Paul speaks about virginity. St. Paul speaking about Virginity, that the unmarried man or woman can dedicate themselves totally to the Lord 
They don't have to be concerned about pleasing their spouse. And some have looked at this passage as kind of denigrating to marriage, but here's what Father Stravinsky's comments on this. He says, it would seem that St. Paul is saying, however, that given, given the radical nature of Christian discipleship and the pressing and good demands of marriage, the two states are incompatible within one person. Seen in this light, what the apostle was holding out for and what the Latin church has opted for is an understanding of matrimony and holy order as both deserving, both deserving of full commitment with no divided existence. Far from being a negative judgment on marriage then, the church's position exalts Christian marriage and urges taking that vocation and sacrament seriously, as seriously as priestly ordination. One of the other authors in here is Dr. John Haas. He is a president now of the National Bioethics Center in Philadelphia. And he's also a father, I believe, of nine children. And he was an Episcopal priest. And so in 1982 was what was called the pastoral provision where those who were Episcopal priests could remain in the married state and could be ordained to the Catholic priesthood. And so he had that opportunity to pray about this, to think about this. And he said that he came to the conclusion that he couldn't really give both their due. He couldn't live both at the same time and give both the adequate attention and totality of the gift of self that both vocations really demand. And he tells the story of one night, his wife was sick, and at the time they had eight children, two of his other children were sick, and so he prepared the evening meal. He was attending to his wife and his sick children. Uh, he, was, he had to clean up the house, he helped his daughter with her homework, and he fell into bed exhausted at midnight until two in the morning, uh, their infant was crying because it had a fever and so that was the last sleep he got. You know, he's walking with that infant, he's walking with his sick children who are crying, he's cleaning up after them and their sickness and then he had to go his, the next day to his work, to his employment, and he had to fulfill his prof professional responsibilities. But during the day, he had the opportunity to attend mass. And as while his mass, the, the priest looked a little bit tired too, and he said that he was sorry he wasn't able to prepare a homily. He'd been up till midnight counseling someone, and he fell into bed dog-tired until two in the morning. The phone rings, and it's a, a woman whose pre-born child is near death. Um, at the hospital, and so that was the last sleep that he got. He went to the hospital. Her husband was away at sea in the military, and so he was able to be there for her. And he said, I realized that day that both really required sacrifice and the commitment, the totality of the commitment of that person. He couldn't have fulfilled both of those needs at the same time. There's also a Protestant minister's wife, I think she has now since become Catholic, and her name is Jessica Millard Hartman. And she talks about the fact that both marriages and ordinations take place before an altar, and an altar is a place of sacrifice. It's a representation of the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary. And how that is fitting because both are gonna require sacrifice, a laying down of one's life. And she talked about the stress that being a minister's wife brought on their marriage. It brought many moments of crisis. And whereas for families that holidays like Christmas and Thanksgiving and Sundays and so on was a time apart from work where they could be together, this was quite different in their own home where her husband had to be preparing a sermon for the next day or he had to be doing attending to the flock. 
and it brought so many different tensions in their own married life and, in fact, crises. At the end of her article, she talks about asking her daughter what it was like for her to live with a minister as a father. And she replied that it was like missing one family member. She loves her father and he loves her. Her father and I, Jessica continued, have long since patched up our differences and recommitted our lives to one another. But the problem of not serving two masters is still with us. And sometimes the family still gets the short end of the ministerial stick. Until such time, I shall struggle on as the wife of a minister, but I'm also deeply appreciative of the wisdom and sensitivity of the Catholic Church's position, whereby neither the covenant of priesthood nor the covenant of marriage must exist in tension and competition with each other. So I think there are important points. Uh, this book was, the copyright is 2001, so it's been around for a while, Priestly Celibacy by Father Peter Stravinskis. He's the editor of it. I begin with that because of the Lord's words in today's gospel where James and John, their mother is asking for a special privilege for their sons. And the Lord asks them about their willingness to drink from the chalice that he is going to drink from. And right before this, he has predicted his passion, that he's going to be handed over, he's going to be condemned to death, and that he's going to be crucified, mocked, scourged, and crucified. And so he asked them, are you willing to drink the chalice that I am going to drink of? You know, in the ritual of marriage in 1969, when that ritual was revised, revised, there's provision made for that married couple to receive Holy Communion under both forms. So the sacred host and the precious blood from the chalice, to drink from the chalice. Of course, that's something that a priest, it is his privilege every day. Um, to drink from the chalice when our brothers make their professions, their first or their final professions, they receive from the chalice. And so there is that component in every life of drinking from the chalice of the Lord, of sharing in his cross, of laying down one's life. And so Jesus said, whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And if we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ, that means we're going to give our lives too with him. That there is going to be a drinking from that chalice. While I was home in Iowa, uh, I had the funeral mass for one of my uncles that I was close to uh, throughout my life. His wife is my godmother, Marge. And at the funeral mass where many of my relatives that I hadn't seen for so many years were there, uh, I began my funeral homily and talking to, especially to his children and to his grandchildren, to their children and grandchildren, about the fact that Marge and Leroy were married for 55 years in sickness and in health, in good times and in bad. And there were bad times. And yet it was that fidelity to what the, the vows they had made before the altar of the Lord that really, as I said to their children and grandchildren, that gave you this stable home by which you were able to flourish. And so it is that laying down of their lives that enable their children to do well in life, just as it is a priest or religious laying down their lives, or any of us who are followers of Christ and laying down our lives, that enables others to flourish. And that sacrifice 
should not frighten us that following the Lord means that there's going to be a drinking from the chalice. Yes, well, life has suffering. It's part of the makeup of our human existence. But Jesus also said that he who would save his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake and for the gospel will find it. That they're gonna find and understand the deepest meaning of life is to love. I recently had the opportunity also to read a wonderful little book. Uh, Steve Thompson works here at the network and his wife Maria wrote a little book about their mother, her mother, who died just a few years ago. And the title of it is See You in Heaven. And she relates here how her mother loved being a mother. And that was how she gave herself so totally to this vocation of motherhood. And she has in here some of the, her favorite quotes that her mother had written down and given to their children that she would sometimes write down a little passage or a quote or some thought for the day for each of her, for her children at home. And here was one of them. Why were the saints saints? Because they were cheerful when it was difficult to be cheerful, patient when it was difficult to be patient, and because they pushed on when they wanted to stand still and were agreeable when they wanted to be disagreeable. That was all. It was quite simple and always will be. And here's another one that I wasn't familiar with of St. Teresa of Avila. To serve when there is no delight in serving, this is true love. To serve when there is no delight in serving, this is true love. It is in laying down our lives, in imitating our Lord, who knew what awaited him, and yet he continued toward Jerusalem because he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So in this season of Lent, let us be strengthened as we contemplate our Lord's own passion, especially in these days. That yes, the passion is an element of our own life too, but so is the resurrection. And I always love that quote of St. John Paul II, whenever we receive Holy Communion, we have a little foretaste of the resurrected life. We experience in some way our own resurrection. That's what gives us strength, the sacraments of life, prayer, drawing near to the Lord, that we have this supernatural strength that enables us to endure the difficulties of our lives and our vocations and to bear this lasting fruit. Because when a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, then it bears that abundant fruit. May our lives, like the saints, bear abundant fruit of the Lord in being his faithful disciples.